Today, we're diving once more deep into the realm of anamorphic shooting with DZO's new 2X anamorphic lenses, the Pavo. Full-blown anamorphic cine lenses that try to win the hearts of the community by offering a classic anamorphic look while still being light and small enough to fit smaller production needs. Without sacrificing image quality? All that at a competitive price? Let's see if DZO built the one lens to rule them all. We put the Pavo anamorphic lenses to the test. We brought a Pavo set in the studio and made a shootout against the Atlas Orion. Our test footage has been shot on Alexa, a Marvel and an S5 2X. We also included some experiments with anamorphic autofocus using the DJI LiDAR autofocus system. After all that, we bring the Pavo on location to tell you how they work in a tough production environment. If you are into anamorphic filming or photography, this is for you. There might be no other process or technique that defined a cinematic look of an era more than the anamorphic process. It became ingrained in us as the way that big budget movies look and today it is still used to break up the sometimes sterile digital image. If you know our channel, we have quite a history with anamorphic lenses and our scope series covers about everything you might want to know about the subject, following one of our favorite movies, Blade Runner. We cover what anamorphic is and why it was invented in the first place and the traits that make anamorphic so special in a cinematic context. We dive into the history of widescreen and anamorphic cinema right up to the rebirth of anamorphic in the digital age. Scope Chapter 2 tests a variety of solutions from DIY to adapters to full-blown cine lenses and Chapter 3 goes into modding. This episode will refer to these episodes if we talk about general things. So, if you're not sure about something regarding anamorphic, but you would like to find out, the Scope series is a great resource. DZO is known for their lenses that are specifically designed for filmmakers. Their Vespid Primes, for example, are uh, very popular and deservedly so. They also have a range of uh, cine zoom lenses, like for example the Cutter Ace here, that we had the chance to test last year. And they are excellent. We are really fond of the way that DZO approaches the lens design. So we were very excited when we heard that they were working on an anamorphic Cine Prime set. And I'm proud to say that they talked to us from an early stage of the development. For example, the early prototypes had significant pin cushion distortions, which are actually quite normal for compact designed lenses. But they worked hard to change it and the lenses now exhibit barrel distortions that are much more favorable in an anamorphic context. The end result are the Pavo. Full-fledged cine lenses, 2x stretch factor and you might have guessed it, the 70mm is filming me right now and AI is actually pulling focus. The Pavo lenses are anamorphic cine primes with a classic 2x stretch factor that covers Super 35 and beyond. The initial release contains six focal lengths of 28, 32, 40, 55, 75 and 100 mm. More focal lengths are in development and to be released soon. All existing lenses have a maximum aperture of T2.1 except for the 100mm that is T2.4. 14 iris blades provide a smooth over bokeh at any stop. The lens diameter is 95mm that allows to use smaller matte boxes. There are two versions, one with neutral coatings and one with blue coatings, resulting in neutral or in blue flares. 3 and 6 lens sets are available, but you can buy them separately too. They are very light and small for anamorphic lenses of their kind and promise very good close focus. The specs of the Pavo sound like something that we and many others have been looking after for ages. Well, Pavo also means peacock. Uh, so we went out to test if they are just showing off or if they can deliver on the promises. 
For a test we have a three lens set and we have had it for quite a while now so we can give you a quite sophisticated opinion. Full disclaimer, DZO gave us that set free of charge. Lucky us. But that doesn't mean we can't give you an honest opinion. And before we go into the test, let's have a look under the hood. The set comes in an original lockable pelle case with a very nicely designed foam inlay. DZO is always exemplary with their cases and the added value is considerable. Our set contains the 28mm, the 40mm and the 75mm focal length with PL mounts. The set includes user changeable EF mounts, shims, screwdriver and screws for lens support. This is what we would describe as a minimal working set. It is nice to have a larger set, but you can get just about anything with the three focal length. It is hard to design extremely wide anamorphic lenses. 28mm with a 2x anamorphic stretch factor have the field of view of a 40mm lens if used on a 4x3 sensor mode of an Alexa Mini. So to have such a wide focal length in the set is just awesome. Most of the time the 40mm will give enough field of view. In an anamorphic context, 75mm still offers a good field of view, but you have the instant gorgeous effect of a portrait focal length. All lenses open to T2.1. Aperture and focus have standard gearing and they're all in the same positioning for quicker lens change. Our lens has the neutral coatings and that promises to result in flares that take the color of the light source. I can't deny the geek in me, the Pavo are quite handsome lenses. Having interchangeable PL and EF mounts, you can adapt the power to about any camera system. For short flange systems like E, L, RF and so on, you can use an adapter. DZO has the very sturdy and well-designed Octopus PL adapter with many options. We have a PL to L Octopus right here and that allows us to adapt the Pavo to our Panasonic cameras. While the Pavo are designed for Super 35 format, they do cover a bit more if you have to. And if you want to cover full frame sensors, you can use an extender. DZO has an extender called the Marlin in the program and being the nice people that they are, they send us one of those too. You can use a Marlin that adapts directly to E, L, R, F and so on. Or combine a Marlin PL to PL with an octopus. As both are locking mechanisms, the only potential weak spot is the camera mount itself, if you use them on a non-locking mount. Using the Marlin means that you lose one and a half stops. Of course, it's an extender. This also means that you can theoretically use your set with the extender, but on Super 35 mode, effectively creating a five or even six lens set with an additional fake 52 mm, 64 mm and 120 mm. We will test later how much each focal length really covers and how well the extended focal lengths work. One of the most obvious features of the Pavo is their form factor. They are surprisingly small and light in comparison to other anamorphic lenses and DIY solutions of course. This is the 40mm DZO Pavo next to the Atlas Orion. Both lenses are designed for Super 35 and both lenses have about the same speed. Still, the Pavo is about half the size, weighing only about 1.3 kg compared to 2.4 kg on the Orion. Form factor and weight make the Pavo much more usable on gimbal, sliders, lighter tripod and even handheld. But how do the Pavo achieve the smaller form factor and at what cost? Important for this is what kind of focusing system a lens uses. Different focus solutions come with different up and down sides. We go deep into that subject in scope chapter 1, link is in the corner. A common solution to focus an anamorphic system is a variable adapter built into the front of the lens. It also prevents the bad close focus performance and loss of squeeze known as anamorphic mumps. The problem with vary diopter solutions is size and weight. The diopters have to be large to cover and their position inside the lens puts the weight in an unfavorable position. So does this mean that the Pavo uses an alternative solutions like mechanical synchro or the Gottschalk method? No, the Pavo are confirmed to use a diopter system, just like the Atlas Orion or lower Protoys. So how exactly did DZO do it? 
Well, they weren't able to give us a satisfying answer to that. Our test will show if there are downsides to the form factor in terms of real-world image quality. One more interesting feature is the ring in the back of the lenses. This allows you to adjust the flange distance without having to shim the mount. Anamorphic lenses require a precise flange distance. The spherical and the anamorphic block inside the lens have their individual required flanges that need to align perfectly to achieve the best optical performance. In a perfect world, the mount of your camera is shimmed to the correct flange and the mount of your lens is shimmed to the correct flange. If this is the case, the middle position of the flange adjustment ring will give you the right flange. If adapters or mounts are not perfectly shimmed, the PAV will allow you to adjust the flange on the fly with the ring. Pretty cool. The pre-release version we have here have one hand screw to be fixated. In the finalized version, there is one screw that requires a tool. DZO changed that last minute to make sure that adjustments would not happen by accident. The PAVO have 86mm threads in the front, which is another great little feature that makes life easier, as they allow you to use relatively cheap filters and diopters. We use a 95mm diopter set from Vivita with the help of a step-up ring. Specs are only skin deep, so let's see what the PAVO can actually do. We have quite an extensive test for you. First we're gonna go inside a studio with a controlled environment. And after that, we go on location to throw them in a more unexpected uh, environment and give you our five cent for each and every focal length. We set up three different colored light sources to judge the neutral flares of the Pablo. Putting our setup on the spike motion control system will allow us to precisely replicate the movement to see difference in flare characteristics. To have a little bit of fun with this, we tried a bit of a John Wick theme in grey. On spike, we use the Ari Alexa XTM that records Ari Raw in open gate mode. For the later statical test, we will also use the full frame Kinefinity Marvel F to judge coverage, breathing, close focus and so on. Breathe. 
Let's discuss the traits of each lens, starting with the 28mm. On full frame open gate, you can clearly see what coverage you can expect from the 28. Using 6x5 crop shows that the 28 still vignettes a bit using full height of the sensor, besides the distortions get severe towards the sides. In Super 35 6-5 mode we get what the lens was designed for and the field of view is still extremely wide. The barrel distortions gives a classic vintage anamorphic look. We do see a sharpness fall off to the top and the bottom. Focusing from close to infinity reveals very moderate breathing like one would expect on a wide lens. Using the Marlin 1.6 extender, we effectively get a 44mm lens and see that we can cover full frame open gate without vignetting. Using a reasonable aspect ratio, you see how your faux 44mm would look. We don't recommend to shoot below T4 on the Aperture wheel as the image gets too soft with the extender. Still a great option if you don't have a 40mm. Close focus is very good at only 40 cm without a diopter. With the very wide field of view, diopters can cause a tiny bit of vignetting that might have to be cropped out depending on the context. With plus one, you can get this close, but who wants that? All Pavo lenses flare mildly, soft and nicely layered. With the neutral coatings, flares are colored in the color of the light source. Neutral colored sources tend to flare less obvious than saturated ones. The Pavo are also available in versions with classic blue flares. We had several occasions where we expected expressive streak flares, but didn't. To get strong streaks, you have to get a very specific angle. Bokeh tends to be a little bit distorted across the field, which is a side effect of the small form factor. With close focus and wide open, Bokeh can look a little bit swirly, adding a bit of a vintage vibe. The 40mm covers full frame slightly better, but it's still not quite enough to cover 6x5 full frame height. In Super 35 6x5 mode we get what the lens was designed for and the distortion is much reduced compared to the 28. Breathing is slightly more pronounced, but still very controlled. Using the Marlin 1.6 extender we effectively get a 64mm lens that can cover full frame open gate without vignetting. Accordingly, it is perfect on a 6x5 full frame height. In Super 35 mode, we see how a full 65mm would look. We don't recommend to shoot below T4 on the Apache wheel as the image gets too soft with the extender. Close focus is 45cm, which is stellar on a 40mm lens. And a plus one diopter will give you this. As to be expected, the flare characteristics are absolutely identical with the 28mm. The 75 can actually cover full frame open gate with just a hint of vignetting, making it perfectly suited for using it in full frame height with reasonable aspect ratio. The performance to the sides is sufficient. This means that you could use the 75 to mimic the field of view of a 52mm Super 35 lens, if you have a camera that can shoot full frame height. With Super 35 6x5 we get what the lens was designed for, with a really beautiful anamorphic look. 
there is no barrel distortions to talk about and the image is perfect right into the corners. Like to be expected, breathing gets a bit more with a longer focal length, but it's still absolutely fine and considered an anamorphic trait. Using the Marlin 1.6 extender, we effectively get a 120mm lens and see that we can cover full frame open gate and subsequently full height 6x5 without vignetting. In Super 35 mode, we see how a faux 120mm would look. We don't recommend to shoot below T4 on the aperture wheel as the image gets too soft with the extender. That means that you could stretch the 75mm to work as a set in one as a 52, a 75 and a 120mm. Not too shabby. Of course, you would need a full frame camera and the extender. Close focus is 84cm and a plus one diopter will give you another one of these. Just for fun, if you combine extender and diopter, you can get too close. In the studio setup and as to be expected, the flares look identical to those of the 28 and 40 mm But in the projector set, it looks like the 75 was a bit more willing to flare with streaks. Not too expressive, quite lovely actually. Wide open and focus close, the 75 shows the same hint of swirly and slightly distorted bokeh over the field of view, giving a vintage vibe. Let's pitch the 40mm Pavo against the 40mm Atlas Orion. As to be expected, the 40mm Orion doesn't cover full frame open gate and 6x5 height vignettes considerably. Using the Super 35 format the lens was designed for, we still see vignetting from the reflecting light sources, something we didn't see with the Pavo. Close focus is 53mm. In a direct comparison we see that the Pavo covers slightly better than the Atlas, which surprised us a lot given the much larger front of the Atlas Orion. The flares of the Orion are more pronounced and show clear oval patterns next to the very smooth and less defined flares of the Pavo. Color vignettes are only noticeable on the Orion. Looking at overall sharpness we have to give the win to the Orion, but in the close focus department the Pavo is the clear winner. The Pavo is small enough to be balanced on a Ronin gimbal, which gives us the opportunity to test the DJI LiDAR focus system that only works with the RS3 Pro, at least at this time. Focusing with anamorphic lenses is much harder than with spherical lenses as nothing really pops and automated focus is very welcome, especially on gimbals. The system recognizes faces and other shapes using the same CPU that is used with their larger drones using AI and it works amazingly well, if the system is calibrated precisely. Working with a gimbal becomes a breeze, nailing the focus distance with inhumane precision. Objects that may overlay the point of interest do not distract the system. Focus remains on the person, at least to a certain extent. Studio setups are interesting, but sometimes you just want to take lenses out in the wild to see how they perform in conditions that are not tailored to suit the lenses and the camera, but gives them a challenge. So we grabbed our Pavo set and visited one of our favorite locations, using only available light. This is Descent. For a minute.
minute in the quiet it feels like it was before I get lost just for a moment thinking I'm not where I am And I didn't want to feel this way Try to be an out of place Give me a one way ticket out of here someplace I know I can't be happy It's not in my head I can sit and cry about reasons why I'm in this mess Let's talk a bit about our shooting experience. We shot all the footage on a Kinefinity Mavo LF Mark II, except for two gimbal shots that used the Panasonic S5 2X. Both cameras have full frame sensors and to see the lenses in their native format, we used the Super 35 4.3 crop mode for all shots. The result is an extremely wide 2.74 to 1 aspect ratio and we choose to keep that so you can judge the Pavos right into the corners. Besides myself, our team consisted of Max and Max that both already collaborated with us in our F0.3 episode where Max is our man that found himself in the INC. If you missed that one, link is in the corner. Interestingly, the other Max shot the behind the scenes also on a Kininfinity camera but with a Fujina zoom lens, giving you the opportunity to really see how different the vibe between anamorphic and spherical lenses is, even if color science and grading is very similar. We chose to use a 10-inch monitor to make the difficult focusing with anamorphic lenses a bit easier. The Marvo and the Pavos are both relatively light, but with the 10-inch it's better to use some support and we opted for a gimbal support vest using just one arm. This allows to keep the rig in unusual positions with considerably less shaking than when shooting handheld. The 10-inch is a bit like a mobile field monitor and it's great to show and explain what you are going for to your team. Talking about difficult focusing, this is by no means the fault of the Pavos, but a general problem shooting anamorphic. As the overall image is much softer, there is less pop in the focus subjects and it's simply harder to judge where the focus lies, even with a focus assist. The long focus throw of the Pavos is smooth and nice and makes focusing as easy as it gets. The close focus ability of the Pavos is stunning. We didn't have to put on the optus for any of the shots. The high speed of the Pavos allowed us to shoot in dim situations like the staircase in the beginning of the film. All staircase scenes are shot on the 28mm and at the maximum aperture of T2.1. I really love the extreme wide field of view of the 28mm in this context as it helps to capture the vertigo inducing abyss of the location. While the shots have a vintage vibe, everything stays quite controlled and chromatic aberrations are not overwhelming even wide open. As you see, depending on the context, T2.1 is usable and that is quite awesome for anamorphic lenses that are infamous for falling apart wide open. Like to be expected, the ultra-wide 28mm shows a distinctive barrel distortion, which makes me extra happy that DZO chose to overwork the pincushion distortions of the early prototypes. The 40mm has considerably less distortions and renders the field beautiful and consistent. The 75mm is your instant handsome focal length and naturally it shows the least distortions. And 
anamorphic lens is very subjective if you want to discuss things like the quality of the image, simply because uh, people are looking for vastly different things when they are talking about the image quality. Some might look for an extreme anamorphic look that really dirties up the, the frame and gives a very emotional result. Other people might look for something very clean about the, about the whole frame uh, and praise things like their usability in a context where you can use it for multiple aspects at the same time. If image quality is paramount, then things like form factor or price, they might not be that important. But whatever you do, in which direction you uh, go uh, with your lens, there's always trade-offs. You can't have one without the other. So having been in the shoes of all those uh, views of an anamorphic image, I can totally understand everybody, but there is no right or wrong. There are always just trade-offs. The Pavo attempt to strike a good balance between aesthetics, practical and economic aspects. This might be just the right approach for an owner operator or rental house that wants to get the most out of their investment. And it might be the wrong approach if you look for something that really suits a specific vision. For the latter, renting the right set will be the best solution, if you can afford that. Or building something yourself can be the right solution, if you have the time off and on set. We really like working with the Pavo and think they are a great choice, especially because they are so versatile. Let's talk about the image first. The Pavo don't have the most expressive anamorphic characteristics of the lenses we have used or seen over the years. The designers balanced the clean and sharp look with a vintage vibe, and I think they did a pretty good job with that. Images can look clean and modern when shot above f4, but they can also have a nice vintage look when we shoot wide open adding a hint of a swirly bokeh. The small diameter of the lens has its merits in the size and weight department, but it also takes its toll on the bokeh. Bokeh is not as round and even as the bokeh of some larger competitors. And it tends to be a bit messy over the field. With the neutral flare version, anamorphic streets are not pronounced. If they pop in, they are very nice, soft, interesting and multi-layered. We really like that they don't show harsh defined streaks that look like fishing line filters or distinctively colored flares that are really not that tasteful. Some might miss expressive flares, but the more subtle approach is preferable if you are not into hammering home the anamorphic nature of your footage. You can produce distinctive flares with the Pavo, but you do have to look for them a bit. Practically, the Pavo are better than everything I work with so far. Diopter design anamorphic lenses are usually big and heavy, and that means that you have to rethink your entire infrastructure from tripods to gimbals to sliders. Not with the Pavo. They're super light, relatively, and compact enough to go on handheld gimbals and mirrorless mounts without creating fear inducing leverage. If you are used to shooting with spherical cine lenses, the Pavo behave pretty much identical to that on your rig. The PLEF switchable mount in combination with the octopus adapters or the extender allow them to be mounted on about any camera. One of the huge benefits of diopter designs is that they don't suffer from anamorphic mumps and that they are better at focusing close. The Pavo excel in close focus capabilities, which really helps if you want to crawl into your character without slowing you down. Build quality is great, focus and aperture are smooth. The 270 degrees focus throw offers a good balance for precision and still allowing to pull focus manually with a follow focus. The adjustable flange is a great little add-on. Just make sure that the screws are tight at the beginning at the shoot. You don't want to change the flange accidentally. Comparing working with a Pavo to a DIY setup is, well, not fair for sure. After many years I came to the conclusion that I can't use DIY on commercial jobs as they're just too unpredictable, have too many flaws and too many points of failure. While the Pavo are just like working with spherical cine primes. Throw the lens on, dial in an anamorphic mode, turn on the squeeze on your camera monitor, shoot. Priceless. 
talking about price, around $5,500 per focal length, depending on where you happen to be, is certainly quite a bit of money. But by comparison, that is very affordable in a class that the Pavos are competing in. Also, you don't have to deal with the long pre-order or delivery times. The Pavo are not built to order and should be with you in just a couple of days. Are there cheaper ways to get to an anamorphic image? Sure, but you always get what you pay for. The bang for the buck that DZO offers with the Pavo seems great. We were amazed how different the Pavo lenses look depending on the situation uh, we put them in. And I do mean that in a positive way. In the studio, in the apartment, outside, in the staircase, in the tunnel, while we kind of knew what to expect from them, they always surprised us with something new in the given situations. I remember our talent Max from the Descent film looking on the monitor on location and saying something like, I always want to shoot anamorphic after seeing this. There is a certain magic to anamorphic and if that magic comes at such an affordable price, and I mean that from a financial and practical standpoint, what's not to love? If you are looking for a versatile set of anamorphic lenses that doesn't break the bank, take a look at the Pavo yourself. They're definitely worth a look. We would like to thank everybody that has helped to make this test episode possible. We would like to thank DZO Film and specifically Sterix for the support and for the Pavo lenses, of course. It was quite a journey. Thanks a lot to the Marmalade for letting us use their studio and the awesome spike motion control system. Thank you to the crew of the Marmalade, Christian for operating spike and for some additional gimbal work. Pretty awesome shots. Thank you to Max Stahl and Mark Schneider for all the help with the lighting and filming B-roll in the studio setup and of course for some extra cool posing. Thank you to Max Heinemann for acting and Max Hahn for shooting behind the scenes on a location shot in the old Elbe Tunnel of Hamburg. If you like to collaborate with the Media Division yourself, you can always drop us a comment below. This is it for this test episode and I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave us a like if you think that we deserve one. Also, please subscribe because we got excellent things to come. I'm signing out. I'm Nicholas with Nerdlicious Wishes. Shoot something amazing.